Hey, this is Tom Webster, and this is Sounds Profitable for Wednesday, January 24th, the why of your podcast. Since the beginning of podcasting, if not the beginning of time, people have yearned to know exactly why someone does or does not listen to their podcast. Today, I'm going to reflect on that question a bit. Well, I've got a book coming out in a few months. It's a kind of advanced guide to building a bigger show called The Audience is Listening. And I thought you might enjoy this small snippet of it as both a sneak peek of the book and something I hope that will help you think more clearly about your own podcast. In my media career, I've worked on shows running the gamut from Howard Stern to All Things Considered. And here's what I've learned from all of them. There is no more powerful thing to know about your listeners than why they do or do not listen to your show. It's the grail truth. And it's generally one simple thing about your show, and your challenge is to figure out what that thing is, which is not a straightforward task. You spend a lot more time thinking about the nuances of your podcast than your audience does, which means their ability to talk exactly about why they find your show compelling is naturally going to be limited. Sure, they can say what they like, whether it's a certain segment or that the host is funny or the content is interesting, but there's always a deeper truth to uncover. Why is it interesting? Why are they funny? These are the undercurrents of your show and the key to understanding what really works or doesn't work about your podcast. After all, there are thousands of podcasts on your topic. So why yours? Now, by the way, this has nothing to do with the popular phrase, know your why. I kind of don't love that. This concept, popularized by Simon Sinek's TEDx talk, was originally about leadership, not marketing. It suggested that leaders could inspire their teams more effectively if they could get them to buy into the company's overarching why. However, marketers, as we do, quickly adopted this idea, ruined it, and applied it to everything from making shoes to building cars. Now, here's the thing. We aren't making a backpack. We are crafting an entertainment no one cares about the why behind Young Sheldon or NCIS or Law and Order or The Voice. And by the way, they're all the same. We would like to make a profit. In fact, why you are making a podcast is pretty irrelevant to the work of earning an audience. Ultimately, when you launch your podcast out into the world, the reason why you made the thing is less important than the reason why an audience would listen to the thing. And those are not always the same. A podcast, like any other product or service, is a brand, the co-created collision of what you intended it to be and what it's perceived to be. It occupies a position in the mind of the listener. I listen to this show because, well, why? So in the process of building a better podcast, we do start with the question of why. But there are two conditions. First, the most important thing we can know is why people do or do not listen to your podcast. But second, there's no single why. Their why versus your why. Imagine that the reason why you're making your podcast is one circle of the venerable Venn diagram. You know the one with the two intersecting circles. You probably have goals for your podcast. Passive income, thought leadership, part of your sales funnel for other goods and services you offer. Or maybe it's just a creative outlet. Whatever the case, I know you have ambitions or you would not be listening to this now. Whatever flashed into your head when you heard that last sentence is not why your listeners chose to spend time with your show. They have their own reasons, independent of yours, for listening. That's the other circle. When those differing reasons are congruent, when the two circles overlap, then you have a show that is in alignment with your goals and the goals of your listeners. And when you don't, you don't. Let me give you two non-podcast examples, since these are a bit more obvious. When Taco Bell was purchased by Pepsi back in the late 1970s, the brand was launched nationwide with a singular why. It was fresh. Every Taco Bell ad featured knives cutting through glistening heads of lettuce to seal in the reason for Taco Bell's existence in the first place, a fresh take on fast food. That was the company's why, fresh. But this was not the customer's why. No, if you ask loyal Taco Bell customers why they chose the brand over other fast food options, you would likely get some combination of it's late, I'm broke, and I'm stoned or drunk. Fresh is not part of the equation there. 
Now, Taco Bell, to their credit, leaned into this perception. It's better that the customer thinks something about you than to think nothing about you. And today, look at Taco Bell's messaging. Open late, food to live mas, and of course, entire meals made out of Doritos. Taco Bell is a coherent, strong brand because they figured out the why of their customers and simply became that thing over time. By the way, the original owner of Taco Bell was Glenn Bell. Imagine if he were named Glenn Wilson or Glenn Bloomstein or Glenn St. John Smythe. In contrast, GM's defunct Oldsmobile brand is a great example of a product that had a terrible why, hence the defunct part. You can maybe hear my dog having a dream in the background, but we're going to leave that in because you know what? This is a Greyhound-supported show. For General Motors, the why was to have a high-end brand to slot in between their Buick and Cadillac brands, comfortable but not too ostentatious, and not as performance-focused as Cadillac. Its reason for existence, its why, was purely for product portfolio management to ensure there were no gaps in GM's line. So what did drivers think about why Oldsmobile existed? It was a car for old people. These circles, my friends, were pretty far apart at the end, and that's why I'm not driving a Cutlass Supreme to this day. Well, that, and they were, they were pretty ugly cars towards the end. I mean, the Aztec is an all-timer. So asking why is a central question, but not your why. You have to start with your listener's why. Why do they listen? Why do they stop if they do, when they do? Why you, when there are thousands of other podcasts on your topic? And is their why congruent with your why? Or do you have some more work to do? And then the second part of this equation is that there is no single why. And this, I think, is uh, definitely counter to what Simon Sinek talks about. There aren't infinite whys or even an unmanageable number of them, but there are more than one. There are segments in your audience who listen or could listen to your show for multiple reasons, and those reasons are likely to be different. Humans are not monolithic, and what's more, they don't always behave how we think they will. My favorite example of this is with the toy My Little Pony. When Hasbro relaunched this property in 2010, the toys were accompanied by a media property, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, a cartoon. The why at the time within Hasbro was probably something along the lines of, those Powerpuff girls are eating our lunch at Walmart, and we need an answer. Hasbro probably had a sales target of nine-year-old girls, and that informed their marketing and design choices. But a funny thing happened when they paired the toys with the cartoon. They got multiple segments of customers buying their products, and each segment had its own distinct reason why. For the nine-year-olds, it was to play along with the show and maybe keep up with their friends. But the toy became hot with collectors as well, which led to another buying segment who were probably not girls and definitely not nine. They probably looked like the comic store owner in The Simpsons. There was a third segment, though, that not even Hasbro could have predicted. A subculture of adult men who found the show's messages of friendship and compassion incredibly compelling and even began to organize meetings where they could cosplay as various ponies and share stories of their appreciation for Twilight Sparkle. These bronies, or bro ponies, as they were called, were not being ironic or cheeky. Rather, they were sincere about the show's messaging and undercurrent of care. A female offshoot, the Pegasisters, also sprang up, again, not as a joke, but as a sincere homage to the positivity the show embodied. Now, that's a why I can assure you was not on the drawing board at Hasbro headquarters. Sometimes getting to the bottom of the various reasons why someone might gravitate towards your brand, your offering, or your podcast takes a bit of digging, even for the most commodified products. Why do people buy scissors to cut things? Well, to cut what? Quilting squares. Why are you making a quilt? To leave a lasting gift for my daughter who's getting married. Well, now we're getting somewhere. What you discover when you keep asking why questions is that the real motivation behind any of our choices, from what we eat to what podcast we listen to, is driven by something below the surface, something beyond it's interesting, if we just dig deep enough. Thanks again to listening to this podcast, The Why of Your Podcast. This episode is hosted on Spreaker. I'm Tom Webster, and I'll see you next week.